Jesuit Education here at Santa Clara. Uh, and welcome to what is actually the sixth annual Bannon Lecture. Uh, the Bannon Lecture was established in 2014, bringing each year to campus one Jesuit uh, to talk about matters of contemporary interest from a philosophical, theological, or scientific point of view. Uh, today, uh, I'm delighted to welcome my, my friend and my companion, my Jesuit, my Jesuit brother, Father Jose, Father Funes. I'll talk a little bit about um, uh, Jose in a minute. You know, at the heart of our intellectual tradition in Jesuit universities is the drive to know, the itch and the curiosity to know the, to know the world in all its dimensions. Uh, and that drive for discovery as well as innovation is really what Santa Clara is largely about. Uh, the better that we know the world, the better we understand ourselves and what it means to be human. And how we understand what it means to be human, who and what we are, will also shape our ethics as well. It will shape our notions of what we think mercy is, what justice is, and what reconciliation. All these words are so key to our Jesuit intellectual endeavor here. Uh, there is an immensely long and noble tradition of Jesuits being involved in the sciences, and interestingly, many of them have landed on astronomy. Uh, there are, in fact, interesting factoid, 34 craters on the moon and several asteroids named after Jesuits. Um, so in things of bringing these things together, Father Funes' lecture was going to bring this intellectual itch, this drive to know, to get to the frontiers of knowledge. He's bringing that to bear on the possibility of extraterrestrial life and what that might mean, amongst other things, for philosophy and religion. It raises interesting questions. Jews, Christians, and Muslims all hold that humanity was created by God from the earth, from this earth. Jews and Christians hold that humanity is created in the image and likeness of God. Christians hold that God became human so that, in Jesus so that humans could get to share in divine life. What they say nothing about, the scriptures of those three religions, how this would work with Klingons. We do not know what it means, for, for the, what the implications are for forms of life that we might not be able to recognize or imagine. So as technology expands and grows, as we explore the universe more deeply and more widely, perhaps as we make contact with other forms of life, we are forced to examine our assumptions and to think deeper, to think about what it means to exist, what it means to be intelligent. Intelligence and existence in the Christian tradition are regarded as sharing in, participating in God's intelligence, God's existence. But how does that work with AI? How does that work with humanly created forms of life? So rather than being nervous about this, what I'd like us to think is that the technology, uh, which is changing the way that we think and work daily, it also offers, offers us an, an opportunity to do more exploration, to better define what makes us unique and for the reasons and the purpose for our existence. Helping us do this today will be Father Funes. Father Jose Gabriel Funes was born in Cordoba, Argentina and joined the Jesuits in 1985. He was ordained as a Catholic priest in 1995. In 2000, he became staff astronomer of the, of the Vatican Observatory Research Group, and he became associate astronomer of the steward of, uh, uh, of at the University of Arizona. And in 2000, uh, 2006, I'm sorry, he was appointed by Pope Benedict XVI as director of the Vatican Observatory. Father Funes is currently a professor at the School of Philosophy in the Catholic University of Córdoba in Argentina, and he is a researcher at the National Agency for Science and Technology in Argentina. He studies the scientific, philosophical, and religious implications of the search for other worlds. And his work focuses on the anthropological impact of what would happen if we discovered uh, extraterrestrial life. Part of his work is he started a project, um, Other, Otros Mundos, Tierra, Humanidad y Espacio Remoto, which is a multidisciplinary research tank. 
The team of Other is formed mostly of Argentinian researchers at the Catholic University of Córdoba and the Universidad Nacional de Córdoba. And Father Funes also serves on the advisory council of METI, which is Messaging Extra uh, Terrestrial Intelligence. Father Funes, bienvenido. Gracias por estar con nosotros. Gracias. Good evening, everyone. Uh, it is an honor for me uh, to give this uh, Banner Memorial Lecture. Uh, when I got, oh, thank you very much, Dorian, for a very nice presentation. When I got the email from Aaron Wills, that is sitting right there, uh, inviting me to give this lecture, when I saw the Bannon lecture name, uh, it reminded me very nice memories of my time at the Vatican Observatory. I spent uh, many nights at the Vatican Advanced Technology Telescope on Mangram, Arizona, in the facilities that are named after Thomas Bannon, one of the main benefactors. So I'm very pleased and honored uh, to have this lecture tonight. I'm also very happy to see that uh, Katie Stank is here. She's part of the Bannon family. She's a big supporter of the Jesuit astronomers, and she has been also very helpful and a big support to the mission of the Vatican Observatory. So thank you very much. Uh, and I also I would like to thank the Jesuit community that is having me these weeks uh, in Santa Clara. I appreciate their fraternal hospitality. I see that, uh, first of all, I see that there are uh, English students. I am very happy. Uh, but the first thing I, I would like to say is what I used to tell my students. I used to teach a class, uh, an introductory class in astronomy for non-science major, like maybe uh, some of you are, are here. And the first thing, first thing I told in my class was the following. The biggest challenge you have to face in my class is not math, it's not physics, it is my accent. <laughs> so <laughs> my accent, I've been in Argentina for four weeks, for four, no, four years, and my accent is becoming worse and worse. Uh, but then, when Pope Francis was selected, I had the impression that uh, my accent was becoming to be more appreciated. <laughs> so, uh, Father Dorian said the importance of discovery uh, for this kind of series of lectures. And for astronomy, it is very important. In fact, almost every week we have some good news. So uh, I have updated the, the title of my lecture, and if I, now I have to put a, a title for it, I would say this, uh, Another Earth, New Questions. And I don't have many answers, I have many questions. Maybe you can help me in finding the answers. Um, so, on, in January the 6th, two days ago, a NASA a mission test found a, a new Earth size uh, in the habitable zone. Uh, so uh, the planet, um, let's see, TOI 700D is a planet similar to Earth that is orbiting around a star uh, in the habitable zone, so where uh, life may exist. And this star is uh, 100 light years ago, uh, away from us. So this is a, a good news. We are discovering more and more of these uh, exoplanets similar to Earth. So if there are more exoplanets similar to Earth in the habitable zone, this fact, this number, maybe uh, increases the odds for a contact with ET. Uh, this is what, uh, what the intelligent species. Um, if we find an Earth, a similar a planet similar to Earth, in the habitable zone, we may also 
be wanting to know if there are signatures of life in the atmosphere of those planets, in the biosphere of those planets. Here, uh, you see the, the spectra of three planets of our solar system. Here is Mars, here is Earth, and here is Venus. We know at, at the moment that the only place in our solar system where life exists is Earth. So if we find a planet with an atmosphere with a, a spectrum that is similar to the terrestrial spectrum, we may say that there are biosignatures, that there are signs of life in that planet. At the moment, we are not, it's not possible to observe, to detect biosignatures. But maybe in this decade, we are going to arrive to that point. So this is important. And also, if there is life, uh, we want to search to meet ET somewhere. Um, there was a, a workshop organized by NASA on techno signatures. So uh, we are trying to detect um, radio or laser signals that may come from a planet where there is life, where there is intelligence, and maybe there is a technological civilization. This, all of this would imply the existence of intelligence. So as you can imagine, uh, all these topics are very interesting. When as director of the Vatican Observatory, because of my office, or the, the, my, my job, I was a member of the Pontifical Academy of Sciences. Very few people know that the, in the Vatican, the Pope has a, an academy where to be a member of the academy, you don't need to be Catholic. You need to be a good scientist, a, a very important scientist, like a Nobel Prize. For example, I don't think everybody knows that, for example, Stephen Hawking was a member of the academy. Uh, so, uh, when I started my, my job as director, we proposed uh, to the academy a, a, study, a study week on astrobiology. So, in 2009, uh, we had a very interesting meeting with about two dozens of scientists on astrobiology. Uh, the topics uh, that we covered in that, uh, that week uh, were, were origin of life, habitability through time, when the, the Earth has been habitable, life, the interaction between life and the environment, detecting life elsewhere, for example, biosignatures, uh, how extrasolar planets form, and finally, the search for uh, intelligent life in the, in the universe. Um, this meeting had a, an important impact in the social media. Uh, for example, the Washington Post. Uh, it published this article with the headline, When E.T. Phones the Pope, or uh, news techno IBC News, or uh, USA Today, E.T. from Rome, uh, and Time Magazine. So uh, this, this meeting had a great impact in the media. And as a result, uh, we published, I, I, I just was one of the editors uh, for the book, uh, this book, which is the title of my, my talk, Frontiers of Astrobiology. The idea was to publish, because this, the participants of this meeting, they're very well known in their fields. The idea was to produce a book that could be could serve as a, an introduction for people interested in the field. Uh, for example, people that are studying the first years of physics or biology or geology, astronomy. So uh, the last chapter, the last item in, the, in this meeting was about the SETI research, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. And this uh, research, poses many questions. 
basically, I would say the question is uh, what means to be human, as Father Dorian said. So we ask ourselves, uh, what is life? How did it originate? How to describe an intelligent being, an spiritual being? What is a civilization on which principles base? Are we the first and only technologically advanced civilization in the history of the universe? More questions. Could the potential discovery of extraterrestrial life put into question our worldview? What can we learn? What are the contributions, I ask myself, that the philosophical and religious thinking could give, could give to answer these questions? I use this quote from an Italian Jesuit, uh, Father Angelo Secchi, because it's a good summary of these uh, challenges that we have living in the crossroads of science, philosophy, and religion. Father Secchi says, what, what to think of these stars without any doubt similar to our sun, destined like the sun to keep alive an enormous quantity of creatures of every kind, those immense regions must be inhabited by intelligent beings and those with reason capable to know, love, and honor the Creator. Father Secchi, he was an astronomer, an Italian astronomer. Uh, he was, of course, part of this tradition, rich tradition in the Society of Jesus of many astronomers. He was the director of the observatory that used to be in the Collegio Romano, uh, which is now the Pontifical Gregorian University. It was the first Jesuit university in the world. And on the roof of the San Ignatius Church, if you have been in Rome, uh, Father Seiki had uh, his observatory. And he's one of the founders of what we call astrophysics. Basically, I'm not an astronomer. I am an astrophysicist. And Father Seiki was one of the first in classifying stars according to the spectra. Going back to his quote, I divide it in disciplines. What to think of this star without any doubt similar to our sun? Father Seki wrote this in 1875. At the time, people wasn't completely sure that the sun was similar to other stars. Destined like the sun, to keep alive an enormous quantity of creatures of every kind. This is bi biology. Those immense regions must be inhabited by intelligent beings endowed with reason. I would say that this is anthropology, this is what it means to be human, capable to know, love, and honor the Creator. And this is theology. So this is a I, under, I, I believe a good way to put these challenges we have, we face dealing with astrobiology. I also like to put the, this topic, this search for extraterrestrial life, in the context of big history. Big history uh, is the attempt to understand, in a unified way, the history of cosmos, Earth, life, and humanity. We are somehow the chroniclers of this history. We are taking notes of our history, the cosmic history. <coughs> it would be interesting to compare notes with E.T. that maybe is, taking, is writing history in a similar way or in a different way. I don't know the answer for that. But I'd like to put it this in the context of big history. Um, and talking about history, uh, I like this quote we are part of the, of the history of the universe. Uh, the universe is made of stories, not atoms. So each of us has a personal story, a familiar story, story as a nation and as humanity, and also we are part of a cosmic history. Related, putting in relationship, Big Bang and life, I like this to quote these two important authors, Paul Davis and Martin Rees, 
The first says, the phenomenon of life is more remarkable than the other processes that give rise to planets, stars, galaxies, etc. It's very difficult to I understand what I understand to form a star or a planet. And he says, it's more remarkable the origin of life. And then Martin Rees, a famous cosmologist, he's a member of the Pontifical Academy, he's the royal astronomer in England, he said, the most crucial location in space and time, apart from the Big Bang itself, could be here and now. So with these ideas, with these questions in mind, when I return to Argentina, I try to form a team, a, a group of people from different disciplines. For that reason, uh, the, we have a multidisciplinary laboratory. I mean, it's a think, think tank. Uh, we don't have money to build huge instruments, telescopes or radio telescopes, but we have ideas. I hope we have good ideas. Uh, and people want, I wanted an acronym in English and people in the team, they wanted some Spanish words. So we came to this acronym, uh, Other Worlds, Otros Mundos, Tierra, Earth, Humanidad, Humanity, and Space, uh, Espacio Remoto, Remote Space. I could explain the law, but it would take me uh, uh, quite a uh, time. And this is also a way to deal with otherness and diversity. The starting point for our research was the, is the, called the Drake equation. Uh, don't be worried, it's a very simple equation, so I, I'm not going to do any math because I don't know much about, about that. Um, it's like a a heuristic device to look at future contexts. Um, using and the, this quote from Jill Tarter, this, this is a famous radio astronomer, the Drake equation is a wonderful way to organize our ignorance. So uh, this is the question. These are the factors. In white, uh, you have astronomical factors I should have put green here, but it's in red. Uh, biological factors uh, in yellow or orange or whatever are social factors. So uh, the Drake equation gives the number of civilizations in the Milky Way, our galaxy, uh, whose electromagnetic emissions are detectable, from where we might receive a signal. Uh, our star is a star formation rate in the galaxy. Uh, Fp is a fraction of those star forming that have planetary systems. Uh, and E is the number of planets per solar system what they are, that may have an environment suitable for life. We more or less, we know the value of these factors. And then we have a fraction of planets where life actually exists. The fraction of those planets with life where intelligent life exists. From those planets, what is the FC uh, represent the fraction of intelligent civilizations where they have developed technology. And the last factor, the L factor, is the length of time for a civilization to send a sign and to survive. Uh, so my understanding, we don't know much about the last four factors, but the, I, my understanding is that uh, we don't know for sure uh, where life exists. We don't know if this is the only case. Uh, Earth is a rare case. There is no other life in the universe. Or, or uh, if life is a, a cosmic imperative in the, in the universe. So in every corner of the universe, we find life. We don't know that. 
my guess is something in between the, these two points. Um, if we discover life, according to Sarah Seeger, a world expert in exoplanets, this could be the next Copernican revolution. She says, when and if we find that other Earth are common and see that some of them have signs of life, we would at last complete the Copernican revolution, a final conceptual move of the Earth and humanity away from the center of the universe. And then I also quote uh, Natalie Cabrol, she's a biologist, director of the Carl Sagan Center at the SETI Institute here in Montevideo. She says, to find it, we must span our minds beyond a deeply rooted Earth-centric perspective and reevaluate concepts that are taken for granted. So, if we want to establish contact or find it, we need to think out of the box. We need to use different categories, perhaps. So, Natalie Cabrol uh, invited to the community to send white papers proposing answers uh, to these questions or, or ideas. These were the main points. Understand how intelligent life interacts with its environment and communicates, how abundant and diverse is intelligent life in the universe, how does intelligent life communicate, how can we detect intelligent life. So there was a meeting here at the SETI Institute in Mountain View uh, the workshop was uh, titled Decoding Alien Intelligence. And we submitted a white paper, and our paper was accepted, so I, I can. And here is uh, Fred Drake, the famous author of the equation. Here is Natalie Cabral, the director of the Carl Sagan Center. Here is uh, Jill Tarter, and uh, here is our Argentinian friend. <laughs> Um, so, as a result of that paper we submitted and presented, we wrote this paper uh, that was published this year, um, sorry, last year in June in the journal Theology and Science. I'm going to present here some of the ideas uh, that we, we discussed. The city research assumes that we live in an intelligent, intelligence-friendly universe. But do we live in a spiritual-friendly universe? Is the spiritual genesis a necessary product of the cosmic evolution or could have happened on Earth by chance? We include uh, a spiritual factor in the Drake equation. I mentioned that there were social factors. You can put the spiritual factor among them. And using the analogy of planetary biomarkers, you remember I showed you at the beginning a, a slide with biosignatures. Okay, we consider that idea and the concept of no sphere. And we propose two spiritual markers that could uh, showcase a spiritual life in an exoplanet. So, uh, we assume this is very difficult. And I'm just to be very brief, and it, it could be a, for even for, I don't understand much very well this. Because to define a spiritual or spirit is not so easy. Uh, so, we had something like a working notion of a spirit, and we assume that spirit can be described by the concept of nous as something intellectual, as a thinking principle. If you go, for example, to the Oxford Dictionary of Philosophy, uh, nous in Greek means mind, and it's reason, and it's especially the faculty of intellectual apprehension. This is the, the, the concept uh, we consider when we speak about the uh, spirit. And then we borrow this concept of no sphere from Taylor de Chardin, another uh, well-known Jesuit. Uh, 
the emergence of a, a sphere of human thinking, no sphere, as the next evolu evolutionary stage of the biosphere and the ultimate expansion of consciousness into the galaxy. So there are uh, things that uh, there is a biosphere, like uh, on Earth, and this, with evolution, becomes a no-sphere, a sphere of human thinking, and this no-sphere somehow uh, it would expand to the whole galaxy. So, considering by the idea of biomarkers and the no-sphere, uh, we were thinking uh, of a sphere in an exoplanet that could host uh, living spiritual beings. That's the idea of the paper, basically. It's very simple. So we need to construct a model of what it means to be a spiritual being. The only way to do this is using analogies. We don't have any other way. Um, so I'm, I'm not, going to, not to be too long. Uh, maybe there are questions. I can answer them. Uh, we avoid giving a, a formal definition. Nobody would agree on that definition. We prefer uh, to give a description of a spiritual being giving traits. We found 13 traits. Uh, it could be more, it could be less. Uh, it's not a magic number. That This is what I think. Uh, for example, symbolic communication, self-consciousness, uh, ability to create and to be convinced by a narrative, ecological sense, free will, ability to develop a personal relationship with the other and to form some kind of religious community. This among some, some of the traits. So considering these 13 traits, uh, we can regroup them into uh, markers. We call S1, uh, which gives the relationship of the spirituality to the physical world, and it could be related to environmental regulation, global impact, technology, science, and the social relation. And the second one uh, that gives us some idea of the social relationship in a temporal framework. For example, cognition, communication, and intelligence knowledge, acquisition, and sharing. The other idea that is presented in that paper, on Earth, there are some, I just, this is a very reduced summary, some mega structures. Uh, this is the Chinese wall. This is the Golden Gate. And this is, for example, St. Peter in Rome. Let's assume for a moment that we are ET, and from the outer space, we can detect those structures. We, we know, because we live on Earth, and maybe many of you have used the Golden Gate Bridge, and it was built to communicate people. The Chinese wall is a fortress that was designed to protect people. And St. Peter Church uh, has a religious purpose. Uh, it represents our, for Catholics, our relationship with God, but not only that, that we are members of a community and that we have a spiritual leader, which is the Pope. So if we see that image, immediately we think in, in the Catholic Church. Uh, so what uh, good and ET think seeing these structures? Uh, again, last year, uh, in, sorry, uh, we are in 2020, two years ago almost, there was this paper published by Bailey and Lev in the Astrophysical Journal Letters. The Astrophysical Journal is not the weekly world news. 
I remember that when you go to those shopping in this grocery store, you would find the, the weekly world news. I was searching, before, I was Googling, uh, and it seems to me that they, they don't publish anymore. Uh, but you can go to a website and you can find this strange news. Uh, it's a doublet. Well, this paper has been published in a very serious scientific journal. It's the Astrophysical Journal. The authors uh, found an object, uh, probably, is, let me see if I can say it well. I think it's pronounced Oumuamua, something like that. This is a Hawaiian, I understand name. Well, uh, they detected this object that could be like an, an asteroid. The origin is from outside the solar system. And they also said that it could be something like a light sail floating in sterile, sterile space. Could also uh, be a fully operational probe sent intentionally to Earth, vicinity by an alien civilization. Or it could be an, an asteroid or with the proper the natural properties we don't understand very well. But this could be also a, a mega structure in the in the universe, in, co in the cosmos. So regarding the future, uh, Martin Rees uh, says in his book, Our Final Hour, the weather cosmos has a potential future that could be even infinite. But will these vast expanses of time be filled with life or as empty as the Earth first sterile seas? The choice may depend on us in this century. So I, I ask myself this question. What role does the spiritual factor play in the future of humanity? What is the role of religion? Uh, I like to say that there is nothing better for religion than good science. We have nothing to fear from science. And Pope Francis, uh, in Laudato Si, his encyclical, he says, he referred not only to the Bible, but other sacred books. Religious classes can prove meaningful in every age. They have an enduring power to open new horizons. Is it reasonable and enlightened to dismiss certain writings simply because they arose in the context of religious belief? Um, Pope Francis also uh, wrote this in Laudato Si about our common home, which is Earth. A fragile world entrusted by God to human care challenges us to devise intelligent ways of directing, developing, and limiting our power. Interstellar, interstellar travel uh, has been proved until now to be very difficult. It's very difficult even to return to the moon, to go to Mars. So the conclusion is that uh, we need to be aware that Earth is our only home in the solar neighborhood. We, it's very difficult to go to Mars, unless there is a revolution in technology, but at the moment it's very difficult to go to Mars. Uh, to go to an exoplanet that may be 100 light years from us. So I'm going to conclude with this quote uh, from T.S. Eliot. The journey, not the destination, matters. What I mean is that uh, it doesn't matter, at least to me, if we are going to meet uh, E.T. or not, but in the journey of asking these questions, trying to find an answer. In this journey, there are so many learn, things to learn about the universe, about life, about what means uh, being human. Thank you very much. Well, if I had a mind, it would be expanded uh, at this point. So um, tonight, um, we have more than one speaker who is able to think from 
both sides of the brain, in fact, I think multiple sides of the brain. So uh, I'd like to welcome as, as a respondent to, um, to Father Furness, uh, Dr. Alex Zekovic, who will be joining us here in a minute. So um, as you're beginning to move to your, uh, to your places, um, Dr. Alex Zekovic is, is Professor of Electrical Engineering at Santa Clara University. He's also the Associate Dean for Graduate Studies in the School of Engineering. Please do sit down, gentlemen. Um, his technical research includes graph theoretic decomposition algorithms, electric power systems, Boolean networks, and the control of complex dynamic systems. I understand about one of those words. Which one? Uh, <laughs> complex. <laughs> <laughs> um, so so he is a prolific author. He's published over 40 papers in leading journals in these fields, and some of the most important results of those are summarized in one of his books, Control of Complex Systems, Structural Constraints and Uncertainty. At the same time, over the past 15 years, and this, uh, Dr. Zekovic has also done a considerable amount of work in the area of science and religion. Uh, his two books, Truth, Beauty, and the Limits of Knowledge, A Path from Science to Religion, and the unknowable and the counterintuitive, the surprising insights of modern science, are both devoted to that topic. His most recent project is a trilogy on interdisciplinary aesthetics, the beauty of nature and the nature of beauty, 10 dialogues about art and beauty, and the many faces of complexity, an interdisciplinary approach to beauty. Each of these books in the trilogy provides a different perspective on the role that beauty plays, not only in the humanities and the arts, but also in the sciences as well. Uh, so gentlemen, we look forward to your conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have to start with a disclaimer. I am absolutely no expert on extraterrestrial life or astrobiology or any of that. Uh, I'm here because uh, Father Funas and I share a strong interest in science and religion and the relationship between the two, and we have collaborated on this topic in the past. Um, among other things, we're both part of a task force of the International Association of Jesuit Engineering Schools that uh, focuses on that topic. So most of my questions will come from that side. And um, I found the talk, and I have to say I already I had a preview of it, but uh, I found it very intriguing because it raises fundamental questions, such as what is life? What is intelligence? What does it mean to be human? And uh, I like some of the markers that you identified, that uh, we are a species that can create and appreciate beauty, and we're also a species capable of transcendence. Um, it's conceivable to me that uh, some other life, form, form, life forms in the universe, if they exist, might be capable of that. But what about man-made systems? Can AI really create? Um, would it be capable of spirituality? What's your take on that? First, I want to thank you for <laughs> this conversation. And this is a kind of continuation of, of a conversation we had in Cordoba in October. Uh, on science and religion. Uh, the title of that event there in Cordoba was Science and Religion Bridging, something like that. It was in Spanish, but I don't remember exactly. Bridging Silicon Valley and Cordoba because uh, uh, Santa Clara is a Jesuit university in Silicon Valley. And I was with the, that conversation was held in, in Cordoba uh, at the Jesuit university. Uh, so, going to your question, uh, I don't think, basically because of the distances in the universe, that we would ever meet uh, eating flesh. Uh, so, <laughs> I don't think we're going to, to meet uh, Mr. Spock, just to say something. But most probably, if there is some kind of contact, we are going to made a probe, a robot, so, or something like that, that uh, which is artificial intelligence. So it, it could be good to, make, to have some ideas uh, about what, I'm not an expert on artificial intelligence, uh, so this I'm just an opinion. Uh, in our uh, work, uh, we describe what it means to be a spiritual by giving several characteristics. 
uh, maybe uh, AI can fulfill some of the, those characteristics. For example, do science. Uh, a couple of years ago, a paper was published by an astronomer and Google Artificial Intelligence. It was the first paper that an astronomer has a collaborator, has, has inte artificial intelligence as a collaborator. I believe, I think we have differences here, that uh, uh, maybe uh, artificial intelligence can create a narrative. Uh, I maybe uh, is able to do some kind of fine arts, uh, like uh, digital paintings, I guess, or something like that. Uh, I don't know, for example, if they would have the ability to ask why questions, or um, probably this is the main difference uh, with uh, humans. I'm, I don't think it's able to transcend uh, the everyday reality uh, to make a real, to form a relationship or to create a relationship with the other, with the capital letters, or to, some, to have some kind of uh, meaning uh, for life. I don't think that we are at that point, but probably we need to learn more about and the difference, uh, and the difference, and what we how we can collaborate with artificial intelligence. This is my simple opinion. Um, one of the things about artificial intelligence that makes me somewhat skeptical of its limitations is that uh, neuroscientists have established. Uh, experimentally, that there is no such thing as purely rational thought. There's only a combination of rational thought, the unconscious mind, and emotions. Everything is a mix. So we can really formalize only the uh, cognitive and rational part. But the part where creativity truly resides, in my mind, is the unconscious mind and the emotions. Until we cross that barrier, and I don't know that it's crossable, I, don't, I think that intelligence will always have the attribute artificial. So uh, that's, in my mind, a limitation. But it doesn't follow that other species have to have that limitation. Would you agree? Or uh, I, I don't know. I, I don't know. Neither do I. I <laughs> <laughs> uh, these are very good questions. and. Uh, as I have trying to communicate, um, uh, we need to think more about this uh, because it's to know more about who we are, uh, who, what means to to be human. And I don't. I after I we we had the medium prepare more or less a conversation. I came across to a quote from Martin Luther King. And because I don't want to forget to read that, that quote, uh, because it's very crucial for discernment. Uh, we need, in many of the, the questions or topics we are going to talk about, discernment is urgently needed. We need to discern how we are, what we are going to do with the artificial intelligence. Uh, or with other things, or modifying DNA, or whatever. So if you allow me, I would like to read this quote, because I like it very much, and I, I don't want to forgive it. I think it's relevant to the, the, this topic and the, the, the lecture. To save, this is Martin Luther King, in 1947. To save man from the morals of propaganda, in my opinion, is one of the chief aims of education. Education must enable one to sift and weigh evidence, to discern the true from the false, the real from the unreal, the facts from the, myth, from the fiction. I think this is a very nice quote and enlighten our discussion here. Thank you. Um, 
Following up along these lines, uh, it, one of the key questions here is how we probe for these uh, other forms of intelligence if they exist. And uh, there was a quote that you had in one of your slides that caught my attention, uh, which says that the universe is made up of stories, not of atoms. And uh, it sounds poetic, but actually it resonates quite nicely with what some physicists have to say. Um, for some decades now, it's been speculated that information is more important than matter. Um, the Nobel Prize winning uh, physicist uh, John Wheeler uh, once uh, coined the phrase it from bit, meaning matter from information. So uh, that's from the physics perspective. Um, I've seen biologists talk about life also in terms of information processing. And the argument there is that at the moment of death, uh, the physical and chemical composition of the body is completely unchanged. What stops is the flow of information. So it could be a trademark of life as well, not just the organization of the universe. So should we be looking more along the lines of information theory than through uh, the kind of material observations that have dominated experimental physics for a couple of centuries now? Again, I don't know for sure the answer, but my, my approach would be an interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary approach. Uh, because it, it's difficult to reduce all reality or the explanation of reality to information or to matter. Um, we need, and this is uh, why I'm trying to develop this kind of approach to whatever topics or problem we are discussing, even uh, for young people. And what I'm trying to do also, I don't think I'm being very much successful, uh, from the high school or in, in college, uh, it would be, in my opinion, very helpful uh, to approach uh, whatever topic or problem we're dealing with from different perspectives, uh, or from information theory, or from physics, or from philosophy, or even from theology, or religion, or ethics. Uh, we need to be retrained in this way to approach reality from different perspectives. Otherwise, I think we are missing something important. Um, could be information, it could be matter, or whatever. Okay. Um, let me take this one step further because the question of how one might communicate and what to look for is, is critical here. Um, Carl Sagan wrote a, a, a nice novel in the 1980s called Contact. There was a movie as well, which wasn't bad at all. Um, and uh, his idea was that we would communicate uh, with uh, another, uh, with an extraterrestrial civilization using the language of mathematics, uh, prime numbers in his particular case, um, which I, it's an idea that appealed to me at the time, but uh, I read subsequently uh, from both uh, neuroscientists and from uh, psychologists that uh, mathematics is not really what Plato thought it was. It's not a body of knowledge that exists absolutely and that we just discover. Uh, their argument is that it's really a, a reflection of the human thought process, the way the mind uh, handles information. So there's only a quote unquote human mathematics. So it is conceivable then that uh, another civilization, intelligent, could develop a different mathematics and one that we can't even begin to grasp. So if math is not the way, what is? Um, I would like to recall uh, Galileo Galilei. Uh, he is one of the, or the father of the scientific method of physics. And uh, he taught us that uh, to understand nature, the language of nature is mathematics. Uh, so that was a step forward in our way to comprehend uh, nature. Uh, I, I don't know if mathematics is a universal language. I, I don't know if uh, ET is going to speak that language. 
By the way, I recommend a very good movie about uh, communicating with uh, uh, aliens, um, The Arrival. Uh, and I, I read the story, which is very good. Um, and also, is there this, they communicate through mathematics and physics. And also, this, the idea, the implicit idea, is that we have in our way of telling this com cosmic history that the time is linear. Uh, there is, they don't have the aliens in the movie, they don't have this sequence of past, present, and future. What I would say, the, the, the important point is trying to understand the structure of the universe, the physical structure of the universe. Uh, and the way that we have to understand, we have learned, is to describe the universe by the laws of physics, that they are expressed in mathematical language, but somehow they describe a, a fundamental reality, if the ultimate reality of the, the universe. If we're here in this building, and this building is not, not crawling, is because the engineers know very well how to construct. If we send a probe to Mars, uh, and we have some kind of information, it's because uh, we know physics, uh, and we know that the uh, how somehow the universe is responding to us. So there is a, a fundamental understanding of the universe that should be universal. Let me be a devil's advocate then, because uh, I think we can agree that we know the laws of physics as they appear to us, not as they really are. I think scientists and, uh, and, and uh, philosophers would agree about that. And we know from quantum mechanics that uh, the face that reality shows us depends on how we probe it. So if you probe an electron as a particle, that's all you will ever see. You will never see it as a wave and vice versa. So what if another civilization probes it differently and experiences it differently? Maybe that's not absolute either. Uh, yes, but there is, a, uh, I agree. It depends on the scale we are looking uh, into the universe. It's not the same when, when we are talking at the level of quantum physics. Mm -hmm. uh, what is an electron? It's a small ball, very small ball. Mm -hmm. It's a wave, it's a matter, energy. Uh, we have a model to interpret reality. Uh, in philosophy, there, there is a, a way to think the reality that we call scientific realism. So the, the, we have a model, and that model responds to, to reality. Uh, so uh, at the end, I think we need to be, how to say, obedient to the, to the universe or to nature. Mm -hmm. And I, my guess would be that uh, E.T., if he's, he or she is marked, and I think, and also, if we are smart, uh, we need to be obedient to the, to the universe. Otherwise, we are going to destroy, destroy ourselves. If, for example, we don't take care of Earth. Okay. And uh, I cannot not ask a theological question here, because I think that's, at the, that's perhaps the most uh, delicate aspect of what you were talking about. Um, uh, it's conceivable to me that uh, we could be unconditionally loved, uh, although there are other species out there. I mean, this is something that we all experience. If you have more than one child, you can love them all unconditionally. But uh, the Bible and other scriptures argue that the, there's more to it than that, that we are actually special. The term, we are made in the image of God, or we are created co-creators, suggests a little more than just um, even-handed love. And uh, then, of course, there is the question of the incarnation and the doctrine of the incarnation. Uh, how do you reconcile that? Because that's where this becomes very tricky in my mind. But I'm not a theologian, so. 
I leave that Neither. to you. <laughs> <laughs> You're I'm, closer to it. <laughs> I am an astronomer uh, who has studied a little bit of philosophy and a little mm -hmm. bit of theology. Uh, however, I'm going to answer the question if I can. Um, first, I think what science tells us is, this is my understanding, is that we are not special. Okay, we are not special. Uh, we may think that we are the center of the solar system or of the galaxy or even the universe. And there is no center in the universe. In cosmology, we know that there is no center. Uh, each of us, if you want, is a center. This is from the cosmological point of view. From, I am not a biologist either, but I learned a few years ago that 98% uh, of our DNA is shared with the apes. We share the same, 98% of our DNA is the same. And again, from a cosmological point of view, astronomical point of view, we, all of us, uh, we were together. Maybe you didn't know, I'm telling you, but our atoms at some point were in the center of a star. Um, we were all the universe at some point were together at the beginning of the universe. Carl Sagan used to say that we are stellar dust. Um, and Martin Rees, I quoted him in my presentation, he said that uh, uh, we are a nuclear waste from a star. I say that I prefer to be stellar dust. It's more beautiful than being a, a nuclear waste. Uh, but this is what science tells us. From the point of view of theology, or um, if we believe in God, and I'm going to use an image of the Bible, which is the first, uh, second chapter of the Genesis. God formed uh, Adam from the, the dust, and he breathed the, his divine breath. So the, the, the breath of life. This is basically what makes us different, that we have in us this divine breath of life. Uh, this is one way to see it. Uh, that makes us a little bit special. And maybe we can share this uh, with other ETs. Uh, maybe they also share the, the divine bread of life. Um, second, um, we cannot read the Bible uh, literally. Uh, we need to read it in a historical context. The Bible is not a book of science. If I, I want to learn about science, I'm not going to find answers in the, in the Bible. Uh, we need to think that the author of the sacred books of Genesis, for example, they, they didn't know at that time about the quantum physics, the theory of relativity. They didn't know, they didn't discover any exoplanet. So, uh, they, they have a different, if you want, a scientific background, or better. A, they didn't have the same understanding of the universe that we have now. So, uh, what makes us special? Again, using an image, um, we can ask ourselves, uh, what is the relationship between God and the universe. Uh, there are several models here. One uh, is, for example, the relationship between uh, a parent with the son 
or the daughter. This is one model. Another model could be, for example, the author of a novel or a fiction book or whatever book, or the author of, for example, of a sculpture or a painting. Uh, somehow, when you read the book, um, the books and the characters in the book, uh, they, they have a life that may, or for the reader, uh, a character that uh, the author didn't think when he wrote the novel. And for the reader, it has a different meaning, a different interpretation. I'm going to use, to answer your question, the first model, uh, the relationship between a parent and a child. And I would like to ask those of you here who have children, do you have a special children? Uh, then, uh, regarding the, incar the incarnation, I, um, a very famous theologian, Jesuit, Father Karl Rahner, he, the, thinking about the incarnation in other words, um, he said like something like uh, the Son of God. I'm exaggerating, and this is not, I'm not being fair with the thinking of... Uh, it's very difficult to read Karl, Karl Rahner because he's a German theologian, and I, 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 <laughs> so I just you read an <laughs> encyclopedia about this. It's something like uh, the Son of God is jumping from word to word uh, assuming the nature of that word. Here, the Son of God uh, assumes humanity, and we have Jesus. I prefer to think in a different explanation, a different model, uh, with, which I believe is simple and more elegant. I mentioned the history of the universe. In that history of the universe, I think there is a unique event in the whole history of the universe. Star, galaxies, planets. In that history, uh, there is something that happened in Israel, the Holy Land, about 2,000 years ago, that it is the incarnation of the Son of God. Through the incarnation, every human being, uh, before Jesus and after Jesus, somehow every human being, you don't need to be Catholic for that. Every human being is united to Jesus. This is the doctrine of the Second Vatican Council, uh, not about other words, but, uh, and John Paul II in his first encyclical said that through the incarnation, every human being is united to Christ. So, uh, in the same way that we after 2,000 years, very far in, in time and in space from that unique event that was incarnation, maybe other ETs, extraterrestrial beings, uh, are united to Jesus uh, somehow. I don't know how, but uh, we don't need uh, to multiply incarnations to explain redemption and our friendship with God. Uh, let me, um, I think we should get some questions from the audience, but uh, before we do that, let me defend human specialness, if I may, from a scientific perspective. From an astronomical perspective, you're probably right, we don't seem to be very special. But those 2% can be a huge thing if the universe and its processes are nonlinear. If you look at a straight line and you change something by a little bit, you won't see much of an effect. If you look at an exponential curve, you change it a tiny little bit, the difference is dramatic. That one or two percent that represent the difference between us and other animals, that could be huge. Uh, I teach chaos theory. Um, how many of you have heard of the butterfly effect? How would you describe it, anybody? A small change <laughs> in one place can cumulatively make a huge change in a distance. Absolutely. Uh, the metaphor that was used was that the movement of a butterfly's wings in the Amazon could change the long-term pattern 
of weather in China. It's actually technically correct. The system is infinitely sensitive. So saying that we're small and in a tiny corner of the universe does not mean that we would necessarily have no impact. I mean, think of it this way. Uh, through the universe, uh, through us, the universe is actually self-aware. We know that for a fact, and that's not shabby. That, I think, is a good argument for our specialness. But um, perhaps it would, uh, at this point, I could ask uh, if there are any questions from the audience, and then, because the two of us can keep going here for a while. I think we've done that before. <laughs> so, yes? Um, hi. One of your spiritual traits was the ability to invent technology. Uh, mm -hmm. which just kind of surprised me to see that on a list of spiritual traits. Um, Lawrence Doyle was also with SETI, uh, has been doing research with um, humpback whales, which appear to be intelligent and conscious and self-aware, but they wouldn't have technology. Would, is that kind of a limiting factor in terms of how we de you know, develop a, a, an idea of a spiritual alien? Uh, if I understood uh, well your question, uh, well, I, I can explain briefly about these spiritual traits, and some of them is uh, is also to do science and to the ability to do, to make technology. Um, I think that this is a matter of discussion. Um, it's uh, what makes us part. It's not the only thing. Uh, that makes us different. Uh, we can build uh, a telescope, uh, uh, an egg can't, uh, and I think the whole, the, the, all the traits, maybe there are more, or maybe there are less, describe uh, what it means to be spiritual. So in my comprehension, uh, being spiritual means several things that are integrated. They are not separated. Uh, somehow it's the idea of Taylor de Chardin that we evolve in a conscious uh, species uh, and we share this uh, thinking principle that would be this noosphere, this layer uh, of intellect intellectual uh, attitude toward the universe. I don't know if I'm answering your question, but to, to look for technological signs uh, or techno signatures, in my understanding, could also reflect that we are spiritual beings. Other questions? Um, while we're on the um traits that you had, the 13 traits you had up there. Um, I was, I'm thinking, I'm wondering if, if there was an extraterrestrial life that met that, those 13 traits, or an AI, um, even though they're not members of Homo sapiens species, then, then are they humans so that our, our human family just expands? Um, so would, we, would they be human? I guess is my question, and then how? To, so that question of what makes us human, then if they meet those thirteen traits, we just adopt them into the family. I don't know if that makes. I sense. think so. Uh, I don't know if we could call this bigger human just a family, or Homo sapiens, or maybe there is. A, we need to rebuild maybe the tree of life, or no, I don't know what is the right name for that. Uh, maybe there is a, another category that is superior than Homo sapiens, and we will be part of, of that. Uh, let me say something I, f I forgot to say. Uh, when I was director of the Vatican Observatory, I gave an interview, my first interview as director, to the official Vatican newspaper, uh, the Observatorio Romano. And, you know, let's say that uh, today, well, it, it has been about three or four weeks that I haven't heard anything from the paper or from the journalist. So I, I was a little bit concerned uh, because I spoke about Galileo in that interview. 
And I, I thought to myself, maybe I said something that was inappropriate. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, I was at the beginning, uh, I didn't have an Argentinian pope at the time who was <laughs> going to protect me. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Uh, but so I, at the time, Father Federico Lombardi was the press secretary of the Vatican. And he's a Jesuit too. So he was like my big brother in the Vatican. I consulted him for many issues. So uh, I asked him, do you know something about my interview? Because uh, I haven't heard anything. And sometime later, he called me back and said, your interview is very good. <laughs> they are just waiting the time to publish it. Uh, and so the headline of the interview was, it is my brother. Uh, and I made it to all the headlines of all over the world. Uh, I had to change the, my cell phone number uh, <laughs> in the, what is the, Tonight Show by Jay Leno. Uh, I was quoted, uh, Father Guy, uh, Brother Guy Consolmagno got an interview with um, uh, this, uh, he, he used to have a show in the Central Comedy, and he has now a late show. John, John Stewart or jo Col no. Col Colbert? Colbert, Jim Colbert. Colbert. Uh, about this, uh, I saw the interview, and I, my picture was there. So what, the, the, what I was saying is that in that interview, taking the Franciscan point of view, you may remember that St. Francis called... Um, Brother Sun, Sister Moon, Brother Wolf, why not Brother D? Uh, so we, can, we could be members of the same family, very large family. Uh, I think that would be okay, for me at least. I'm just not sure the family would be called human. Uh, so maybe there is, uh, you can propose that. Uh, we might be a... Any different, <laughs> yeah. a different name. Thank you for your um, presentation. Um, so I'm Elizabeth Jensen Young, and I'm in the physics department here. And I actually study exoplanets and the direct detection of them. But I know nothing about religion and theology. But my question lies more of, um, from my understanding, about 400 years ago with the invention of the telescope and Galileo looking out and finding some evidence of like Venus phases of Venus or moons of Jupiter it really shifted the Catholic views of the time. And I'm wondering if you think biosignatures that we find, let alone spiritual signatures, but in the next century or so, any biosignatures we find on exoplanets will shift the view of the Catholic Church? Or will it take time for no, them to catch it? Um, from the point of view of the Catholic Church, I think we are quite prepared for that kind of news. I don't think we are going to change. I mean, we need, uh, Galileo uh, made a big favor to the Catholic Church because since then we understand that we cannot read the Bible literally, but uh, we need to interpret the Bible. And, uh, and the other point, this is a model again, uh, to understand how can be um, a meeting or discovering of a different culture. Uh, one model could be the, um, the, uh, the meeting of uh, Europeans with Native Americans, what happened in, in the 15th century. Uh, that caused a big uh, debate and reflection in the Catholic Church from the theological point of view to understand well that they, they were human beings, they have the, the same dignity of other children of God. So that was a big change in the Catholic Church uh, in the understanding. So I don't think for the future, uh, I think we are prepared. Uh, we need to be patient. I, there is a theologian who is also an astronomer, an Italian, 
who wrote, uh, we need to be patient. Uh, the last word about the discovery of extraterrestrial life is not up to theology, but to science. So let uh, scientists like you to discover more exoplanets and maybe we're going to find biosignatures and other things after, after that. So, uh, I, oh, thank you. Um, to me, I'm, I'm convinced, and I don't think this is any brilliant insight, but that what we're going through right now on a world scale is a big epistemological crisis. And I'd love to hear from both of you since you are both very much in that, not the no man's land to be negative, but that interliminal zone between those two. So I'm wondering how as two people who are interested in both faith and reason, both science and religion, how you've been treated and how you feel about how you've been treated by uh, those who might be more extreme in either direction in your own work and how your work has been received. Um, oh. I, go first? Uh, I think I've been treated very well with my colleagues. I want to tell a story. Maybe this is, could be significant. Uh, in Italy, I was invited. Uh, it was a very important event uh, on science and religion. Um, and you know, uh, one of the speakers was um, Professor, uh, Dr. Atkins. He's very clo close to Dawkins. I, have you ever heard about Dawkins and the new atheism? Mm -hmm. And they are very aggressive. And they think that to be a religious person is to be out of your mind, that you're crazy, insane. Uh, so it's very difficult I, uh, to talk to them. Or, well, I told this story. He, he, we were sitting like this, but he wanted to move there and to preach. But practically, he was preaching. <laughs> uh, well, when it was my turn, I, we were in Milan. Um, um, you know that uh, Cardinal Martini uh, was a Jesuit Archbishop of Milan. And when he was Archbishop, he used to have what is called the Chair of Non-Believers. He would invite uh, scholars uh, to his cathedral and non-believer uh, scholars to speak about the topic. For example, let's say extraterrestrial life or uh, ethics or politics, but from the point of view of a believer and non-believer. And he said, uh, he used to say that in, within us, there is a believer and non-believer. Uh, so when it was my turn, I said that uh, within me, there is a non-believer. But also, I think that in Professor Atkins, there is a believer. Uh, so I think the point is um, to establish a dialogue, a dialogue where uh, you have an open mind. Uh, you think that the other person is uh, in good will, and that is uh, very much uh, able to understand science and to understand religion, though uh, Maybe you don't think the same, but we can learn from each other. And I can learn also from people that don't, don't believe in God, as they can learn from me. Uh, I would say that. From my perspective, I think science and math are a really powerful tool for conversation about religion because every scientifically educated person agrees on certain things. So when I teach my class on science and religion, the first three weeks are science. It's about what science says about its own limits. And you may not like what it says, but you can't really dispute that because there's consensus. So if we agree, starting from that point, that there are certain limits, then you open the door to something you might call a mystery. And we could debate the character of that mystery, but not its existence anymore. It's a much more polite conversation. But when you said epistemological crisis, I, I thought more along the lines of social media. And that I don't even want to go there. but. I will say this, that uh, for about 350 years, we had a consensus on what is sufficient evidence. That's gone out the window. So if you think you have the right to believe whatever you like, you know, Galileo and his followers must be turning in their grave because that's the antithesis of science. Uh, but if we, and 
this is that's why I teach my class to it's it's for engineering students and science and math students. So uh, if you broaden that, then you could have these issues because people. Uh, so I'm very careful who my audience is. Let me put it that way. And but within that group of people, I don't think there's too much controversy. Sorry, sorry to cut off uh, an engaging discussion, but we're out of time. So I want to thank uh, Father Funes. Um, Dr. Zetkovic for, for being here today and for speaking with us and um, I hope uh, to see you at our next event which is on uh, February 11th uh, is why playfulness is a virtue um, so hopefully be another engaging discussion but more importantly I want to thank Father Funes for coming here and being thank you thank you